so the Amiga 500 power supply. Well, you could say it's a bit of a brick. These things are, like many other vintage power supplies, a little worse for wear. And these weren't that good back in the day. And this one's really broken because I've just dropped it on the floor and it rattles now. What if we could replace that with something that's smaller, more efficient, and uses a modern power delivery standard? USB-C isn't just about charging phones and laptops. It has a feature called power delivery, or PD for short. And this allows a device to negotiate for a higher voltage than the stock 5 volts that came with USB. In fact, it can negotiate 5, 12, 15, or even 20 volts, depending on the power supply. This means that USB is a very, very useful and flexible power source, considering that modern power delivery goes up to 100 watts, which is way, way more than an Amiga 500 could ever need. This means we can take any USB power brick, or power bank for that matter, that has a power delivery compatible with delivering 12 volts, and we can use that to power the Amiga. I did a proof of concept on this in a previous video, but that was still using a very small external power supply. What I want to do is to bring all that inside the Amiga, meaning that you don't need anything other than a USB-C connector. To make this as seamless as possible, I've designed a custom daughter board that fits in the place of the original A500 power connector. The board gives us a USB-C connector and a tiny power switch. This in turn has an internal connector for an ATX20 pin. You could also use this board, ignoring the USB-C side of it, and just attach a standard ATX power supply. The power switch would still work perfectly and it would still provide the correct voltages to the Amiga. This means this also could be a solution for anybody wanting to put their A500 inside a larger case. The key to making all this work is this little module here, the CH224K. It's a power delivery controller that negotiates with the charger to give us the voltage that we request. The circuit I've designed configures this to 12 volts. Now the Amiga needs more than just 12 volts, so that initial 12 volts we're going to feed into a Pico ATX power supply and use the outputs from that to power the Amiga. This means we'll get a stable 5 volts minus 12 volts and 12 volts, which is all the Amiga 500 needs. Oh, that's all the theory out of the way. So now the soldering iron's warmed up, let's get into putting this board together. Starting with the controller chip, initially connecting the ground and heatsink using hot air, then connecting the surface mount pins with a soldering iron. Moving on to the USB-C port, connecting first the contacts from the back to hold it in place so we can then solder these tiny little pins. Giving it a good clean up with isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush, this all comes out looking quite nice. So that's all the surface mount components done. It's just a matter of doing all the through holes, which are just capacitors, resistors, some pin headers, and of course the 20 pin ATX connector. Now all that's connected, we're ready to start testing. None of this harebrained, inane tinkering would be possible without my sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay have been producing quality PCBs for well over 10 years now, and they also offer other services like CNC machining, sheet metalwork, and 3D printing. This makes PCBWay a one-stop shop for your projects, and even if you're not happy waving a soldering iron around, they can even assemble PCBs for you. So thanks, PCBWay, for sponsoring this video. Yay! The Amiga board I've chosen is my Ziff 500. It's a working progress. But this is a board I'm intending to have on and off of my bench most often, so it makes more sense for this to have a USB power supply the first thing to do is to remove the existing square five pin power connector. This is what's going to be replaced with the daughter board. For a little safety, I have added a small piece of heat shrink insulation to each of these pins, leaving roughly the height that I need it to go through the board at the bottom. This slots into the footprint that was left behind by the original power connector. 
All I need to do now is to solder it from the underside of the board. Solder then we need to find out whether it powers the Amiga. Plug in the bare minimum and we can see the, the trusty old 3.1 kickstart screen. This at least means that it's powering the Amiga enough for it to be alive. I'm now going to answer the question that nobody ever asked. How much power does an Amiga 500 pull when you're running it off a USB power delivery? Well, by hooking this up through a power analyzer, I can answer just that question that nobody asked. Initially connecting it, we can see that it's showing five volts, and that's because we've not negotiated anything else. Connecting it to the Amiga, we see it negotiate 12 volts, and there we have a steady 12 volt supply. You can also see the orange glow in the bottom corner, which is the power ready LED on my adapter. Flicking the power switch and the Amiga bursts into life. We have a GoTek connected so that it will boot. And we're pulling around the 10 watt mark. We're not even breaking an amp at this point. I suspect if we give the Amiga a little more to do, and maybe we're using an original internal floppy drive and not a GoTek, we would probably see this get to maybe 1, 1.2 amps. But this also does suggest that the original power supply was probably a little over specced, or maybe wasn't quite as powerful as it said. There is definitely some room for improvement. The switch isn't necessarily ideal, it's absolutely minute and quite fiddly to get to. We might be able to do something to make it fit in the Amiga slightly better. One of the reasons why this doesn't quite fit in this Rev 5 is because most of my original designs were around the Rev 8, i.e. the Amiga 500+. Plus. I've attempted to make everything as universal as possible. It's a relatively good fit, but some little tweaks here and there will definitely make it better. I also think it makes sense to relocate the actual ATX power supply. With the use of a simple extension cable, we should be able to move it somewhere more sensible in the case. At the moment, it's sitting right on top of one of the CIAs, which from a heat perspective isn't ideal. I wouldn't really want to run the Amiga for a long length of time with this power supply sat right on top of that CIA. If you found any part of this video entertaining or useful, then please click like. And if you want to see more content like this, then subscribe to my channel. That way you'll get notifications when I post new videos. But in the meantime, why don't you check this out next?